Welcome to another episode of The Shredder Show. Today, we have got an absolutely incredible guest. I've already pissed off with my retardedness with my software being able to get this podcast record. So really excited to have this conversation with Wes Watson. So I listened to Wes speak at a fitness event in Nashville with Tennessee with Vince Del Monte and was literally blown away by his story and going from where he was to where he is now, inspiring men all over the world. So thank you so much for your time today, Wes. Oh, thanks for having me on here. That Nashville event was... That was awesome. I loved coming on stage and just letting everyone fucking know that it's deeper than just fitness. This is the power we put into our lives, the emotional connection we have to everything we must be, the vision we have for ourselves and our families, and how everyone is just missing that. So I loved being able to share my perspective. And thanks for having me on here to do the same. 100%. Now, first to get started, I'm a big advocate of getting up early at 5 a.m., but you take it to another level from what you just told me before this podcast. So firstly, tell me what time you get up, why you do that, and how long you've been doing that for. I mean, it's it's next level. I get up at 2.45. I've been getting up at 2.45 for 14 years now. And that, that really just started because in prison, you have to be up at a certain time. That time is six because you have to get ready for breakfast. So most people get up at five. But I decided to get up way earlier because I wanted to use the bathroom, brush my teeth, do all my stuff before either my celly was up or the people in the dorm are up. So you're either in a cell in prison or a dorm. And I like to get up and use everything in peace, not have to wake up and like be battling someone for a fucking toilet or a sink or whatever the fuck, or even your celly, say you both get up at the same time, someone has to use the fucking bathroom. And um, so I just got up early. I get up early, have my coffee, read, reflect, get my mind right. And I didn't know I was doing something special. So the whole time I didn't realize I would get up at 2.45, go brush my teeth, do the normal stuff. I would go do a quick little ab routine or some stretching or something just to put my mind in a positive place. I would come back to my rack in prison and I would read and journal. And this was about 3.40 a.m. when I would read and journal. And I didn't know till about two years ago that there is a time that you're most aligned with your purpose on this planet. And that is 3.40 a.m. The power of 3.40 a.m. A lot of cultures speak about. And I have been writing the most significant teachings and beliefs that I share across the world at 3.40 a.m. in prison for 10 years. And then when I got out, I was sitting in front of the gym at 3.40 a.m. writing my post for the world, my morning motivation, my morning, uh, what I share with everybody to get them, get their mind right. And um, I didn't know it was at this time until I saw like Saguru post about that. And Dr. Joe Dispenza talk about it too. And I'm like, man, there's something to this. That the level of attachment to your vision and purpose at that time is, it's unsurpassed. And do you think that's because you've almost taken the step to try and take a step in front of the world almost because you, you're up before everyone else? I just think you're, you're leading. So you're, the, the more gratitude you have the earlier you're going to get up to live your life so the other person sleeps in they really say in their mind i don't want to get up how big of a slap in the face is that to creation i don't want to get up motherfucker you get to get up so if i was even in a cell by myself for over a year never stepping out of that cell and i still would get up this early because i called it gratitude for life gratitude is action and I proved with action that I was ready to get up every day and live my life, even though I was in a cell by myself in isolation. And then I took it out here. Once I got to the street four and a half years ago, everybody saw me post at 245 every single morning without fail. So what did that do? That built brand trust. This guy really lives. He shows me he lives what he sells me, which is a program. And all you guys out there listening, on my program, you don't have to get up at 2.45. You get up at an early time that's hard for you. And the purpose is that it's difficult for you. So you're forcing yourself up to then go live your life and show, prove that you have, you're grateful for this one fucking day that you have. Definitely you have this one day and you're grateful for it. I think it's about people just like raising their own personal standards, not letting that drop. Because I think that's a big thing I seem to see year on year is that the standards of everything are dropping. Like you look in schools where kids come 12th in a running race and they still get a trophy. We're like rewarding people for failing almost. Well, the, the biggest thing 
there's that aspect that is 100% true. Fuck that. Like, I, I don't believe in equality. I don't want you to have the same life as me if you didn't fucking earn it at the level I did. You have to work and earn everything that you fucking, that you value in this life. That's why bodybuilding and building muscle is so awesome because that's something you can't fake. You have to really earn it and your results show. You look like how you live. That's the truth. But the biggest thing with me is when you get up early and you have pride and you stack wins, the thing that happens is you shape your world. When you're winning, your world is a reflection of your internal state. So when you're winning, you see wins in Charlie. You see wins in your wife. You see wins in the other person. The people who are losing are the negative people. They chose to lose when their conscience called them to step up. So they see the li their life as a pessimist. Like everything is, is fucking dark. There's no, there's, there's no abundance. Like everything they see their world is negative because truly the world is not as it is. The world is as you are. And if you cultivate your internal state in a positive, strong, loving manner, you'll see a positive, beautiful, loving world around you. And you'll be able to crush it because everything is an opportunity opposed to a closed door for some pessimist who chose to fucking lose all of it. Now, you were obviously in prison for 10 years, as you alluded to earlier, and obviously I've heard you talk about previously. For anyone who doesn't know, that's obviously going to be very like, difficult experience did you always have that mentality even when you're in there like you're in a very pessimistic difficult environment i would imagine did you manage to keep that did that build more resilience into you in that aspect i just looked around and saw everything i didn't want to be like i always had a strong work ethic like i was a pro snowboarder before i was went to prison and shit like that but and i would wake up super early in oceanside california drive to big bear every morning to film my part uh, and like film my video stuff, get this trick on film and go pro, you know? And then I, I went to Tokyo a few times and I've, I had parts in some big videos, but I always had that pro work ethic. And that's the difference. Pros operate from commitment. Amateur little bitches operate from their fucking feelings. And the thing is, is I looked around prison and these were supposedly the toughest guys. Their gang fucking letters tatted all over their face, fully blasted there for murder robbery, assault, drug dealing, everything, the whole nine. And they lived so fucking soft. So in prison, your only validation is how you conduct yourself daily. Because there's no cars, there's no money, there's no women, there's nothing. It's just you. Who the fuck you show everyone you are every day and the results you can get. So I showed everyone every day that I had a stronger work ethic, a stronger program, as we call it in prison. And that was a validating source. When you look around and you see the homie Tripper over here, he was doing his burpees and his push-ups on Tuesday, and then Friday comes and Trips ain't doing his shit. You just think, what, bitch, you don't want it no more or you're too weak to get it? That's the problem with men nowadays. There's so many things they want, but they're too fucking weak to go get it. Why? Because the whole thing is, is if you have vision and no action, you're fucking delusional. And if you have massive action with no vision, you're just passing the time. Until a motherfucker has a true vision coupled with fucking decisive, definitive action, then he's going to change his life. And did you always have the same vision for you, you have now? Did that change drastically always. whilst you were in prison? Always. I always had the same vision, but I tried to do it the wrong way first. So I tried to be a drug dealer. I was a multi, I had millions, Range Rover, lived in a huge uh, dope ass condo down here when I was a kid, like 20. And I, I had a, a pad down, down this way that was like 1.4 million, a condo down here, Range Rover, Chrysler 300, like th those were the cool cars at the time. And you know, I, I had a lot of money. We used to weigh our money because it was fucking, each bill is a gram. So we throw a thousand dollars in twenties on a scale, boom, 50, that's 50 grams, band it up, band it up running through millions of dollars in cash. And the thing is, I always wanted to be jacked, impressive, tatted, and rich. Ripped, rich, rare, as I call it. I always wanted to be that. But I was just doing it the wrong way because I didn't have morals. I wasn't morally correct. So then I went to prison. I saw how bitch everything was, how pussy these motherfuckers were, that they didn't have the work ethic, that they're never going to be the fucking motherfucker I want to be. So then I had to change everything. And it was really easy for me to change because I was the exact opposite. So now I just did everything opposite. I mean, I always got up early, but I, I quit using all drugs. 
I quit drinking. I quit smoking everything. I started fucking measuring my food, monitoring my macros, training every day, regardless of how these motherfuckers think you ain't going to grow if you don't train. Trust me. There's guys in prison who do pull-ups and dips and curls and, and bar work and bag work every day. And they're fucking way more jacked than the dudes in the fucking gym here. And they don't even have enough protein or food or anything. But I, it's just your body will force to adapt to any of this shit. The main thing with me is, yeah, the vision has always been the same. Ripped, rich, rare. But now the rare stands for the morals. That you're this man that's fucking just unbreakable for his people. He's just so morally correct. The rare before was I was a dumbass, rare ass gangster who stood out in a bad way. Now I stand out in a good way. 100%. And in regards to the experiences in prison, one thing I was fascinated about was how you managed to train in prison. Did you have equipment? You mentioned like limited food. Like I'm sure obviously like this is mainly a fitness podcast and you're in a fitness background. Do you have any like insight into some of the stuff that you did then in terms of like food to get your like protein would, in, for example? I, I, would, I would do bar work in prison. So I do pull-ups mainly for back. And then I would do fucking um, dips and push-ups for chest. We'd always put someone on our back with push-ups. We would make shift bags just fucking hitting, boom, just hitting curls with water bags and making magazine stacks for side raises. So we basically did the big body parts with bar work and push-ups added weight. And then we were able to hit the, the secondary muscle groups, shoulders, tries, buys, and everything like that real well because you can make a heavy enough bag to hit arms and shoulders with. But um, then squats, have someone on your back. If you go to my Instagram, I got a little kid. I'm in prison posting on my IG on a, cell, on a smartphone, and I'm lunging a little kid across the fucking day room. And routinely, we'd lunge a track with someone on our back until the cops would pull the mini 14 out on us. I mean, I get that motherfucker down, but yeah, mainly I, I studied bodybuilding before I went to prison. So I had the Arnold encyclopedia. I knew how to hit, you know, chest, shoulders, tries, back, buys, legs, you know? So I knew how to do push, pull, leg routines, all that shit. And I just remade it to what I had available around me in prison. The food aspect. I mean, I kept journals the whole time in prison of my macros. And that's how I got, that's how I have some of the best transformations in fitness now. It's because I know how to alter people's macros for motherfuckers better than anybody on the fucking planet. So, I mean, this is me writing down everything I ate for years on end in prison. This is every day worth of fats, proteins, and carbs, reverse diets, refeeds, everything. So on a day like this, I had 10 amino acids at 4 a.m. And these amino acids were like fucking horse pills. They were like two grams each. You could barely even swallow them. And then at 6 a.m., I had uh, two servings of farina, which is like cream of rice, like oatmeal. And then I had two servings of fruit. And then at 8 a.m., I had six more aminos. At 11 a.m., I had six aminos, some cereal, two state milks. At 12 p.m., I had uh, three eggs, two patties, and um, four pieces of bread and a hash brown. I was obviously in some form of uh, reverse phase right here where I was putting on size. For the whole time in there, I lived my life in a cutting phase and a reverse diet to bulk and put on size. Everybody on the street should either be cutting or reversing. They're just so simple minded. They don't even know what's on their plate yet. So there's no way they can live their life cutting and reversing. So then you get these guys who they're 200 pounds, a sack of shit at 200 pounds. And they're like, hey, Wes, I don't want to get too skinny. I'm like, motherfucker, you are skinny. You've never ate proper macronutrients or trained in a hypertrophy manner. You are the same size as you were in high school, motherfucker, with a bunch of fat. Like everybody who's never trained like a bodybuilder or trained, you're basically your, your post-pubescent weight plus a bunch of body fat. How the fuck could you have put on muscle? What the fuck did you do? You ate how? You trained how? You don't have muscle, motherfucker. That's why I tell these fake buff motherfuckers, they think they're swole and they ain't got no bicep vein popping like me and Charlie. And I'm like, bro, you're fat. Like if you ain't veiny, you're fat. And they're like, no, I'm big. No, you're fat. You have no veins. And they're like, well, I'm not trying to. Yeah, you are. You're just not doing it. That's the biggest problem is the delusion out here. Motherfuckers want to live a certain way and be a certain way, but they won't do the fucking work. So they denounced that they ever wanted it in the first place. Not one man last night went to bed and said, I want to wake up fatter with less money 
and less discipline, a bigger drunk. Not one man said that before bed, but then their actions the next day bring them right into that. It's fucking mind boggling. Cognitive dissonance at its finest. One of the things I find highly amusing as well now is the scenes. I noticed a lot when I was in, I was in Canada for four to five weeks. Is there seems to be a movement of guys who train a bit, who are very overweight, who call themselves power lifters, but they're not actually very strong, but they're just fat. Yeah, it's, it's really just, I mean, it's, it's sad that people have such a shoddy work ethic because in all reality, if you want to be fulfilled in life, this is the equation. Low expectations and a high work ethic will keep you fulfilled. High expectations and a low work ethic will keep you unfulfilled. And that's most people in the world. They want to be a millionaire on, as an online coach or something, and they don't do any of the posting, any of the work. They're not even in shape. It's like, bro, do you realize you have these massive expectations and your work ethic is minimal in prison the whole time? I have no expectations. What expectations do I have? I'm in prison. The only expectation I had was to work my fucking ass off every day to feel good. Like, I didn't even care how I looked really because there was no fucking mirrors. There was no women. There was no pool party, no beach. There was no reason. So it wasn't even about that. It was about feeling fucking great, getting that positive mental attitude, raising my rate of vibration. The byproduct was I was Jack. So by staying in a caloric deficit, always keeping me, like people don't realize this. Charlie is an offering to the world. Wes Watson is an offering to the world. If you show up as a shitty offering, you're just saying, fuck the world. Like you're just saying, fuck you guys. I don't even give a shit to show up to you, right? It's like, dude, nobody's gonna wanna fuck with you if you're not a proper offering to them. And that's what motherfuckers aren't getting. They show up out of shape. They're financially fucking irresponsible. They have all these fucking, they have all these vices that are ruining their life. And they want a great life. Motherfucker, you're a shitty offering. Nobody's going to take that. They're going to be like, oh, no, I pass. I pass. I don't want that. And then they want some model chick. And this is their life. Come on, dog. You know, you see it. The, the big thing I see uh, people make a mistake with is that people focus. They don't focus enough on the process. They focus too much on the prize. They're looking at the end goal, but they don't actually realize what it takes to get there. And they're not willing to actually do the work. And the, they get bored of the consistency. It's almost the same thing in business where people they get a bit successful. I mean, they get distracted and want to go do something else because it's boring, but it's the same with everything in life is fitness, business, whatever you want to do. It's just relentless doing the same thing over and over and over again that works. Like how many probably YouTube videos have you made? Hundreds probably. I, I've never missed a YouTube video since my first upload Monday, Wednesday, Friday, since the beginning. I don't know. I probably have 400 or some 500. We have, um, 415,000 subscribers and, uh, you know, 80 million views or something. But the, the main part of it is that I'm showcasing that I've solved your problem. And they're like, what do you mean? I've solved your problem. You start and stop. I started and never stopped. That's why I'm different. Simple as that. I didn't quit when you did. Leaders have to do more. And what people don't get is I take it very personal that I'm a massive leader. And I'm like, if I slip, my people will fall. So I'd rather die than slip. I'd rather fucking die. Like people are like, you're awfully emotional and intense. Good, that's what made me successful, stupid. What the fuck are you talking about? Like it'll be some guy who has like 200 followers. He's like, why are you so intense? I said, why aren't you? And he's like, I'm like, am I gonna end up like you if I'm less intense with the 200 followers peeing on my mom's couch? Shut the fuck up and get out of here. Like too many people think they have a voice and they haven't earned the right to speak. In all reality, if someone is not where you wanna be in life, you should not listen to them because you may end up where they're at. Like, fuck, it's pretty obvious. The, the biggest part of all of that is though, what you were saying, is that to me, the man who takes more pride in the steps it takes to get the result, then the result itself can't be stopped. And if you watch my page, I'm more prideful that I'm up again at 245 than my multiple Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis, okay? I'm more prideful about the fact that I will not miss for you guys, everybody, than any of my success. You, you can tell that because there's no deviation. If I made millions and stopped waking up at 245, then you would tell I valued myself in my millions more than my 245. 
but I'll never miss till the day I die because I value my word to what I do more than anything on this planet. And that's the oldest shit our fathers taught us is you only got your fucking word. What's up with all these men that'll tell their wife, hey, I'm going to drop this weight this fucking year, honey, and doesn't drop it. And they tell their kids, yeah, I'm going to kill it. We're going to we're going to be financially killing it this year. And they can't pull it off. Like literally, like you gave your word to your people, you punk bitch motherfucker. Back that shit up till you die. Like that's what it comes down to. I think the other big issue that I see with a lot of people is that people are too worried about perfect action and like, I will do this when, like, I'll do this when things are right yeah. and time's right. The time will never be fucking right for you to get in shape. Never. Or like, you're never going to have a completely clear schedule or whatever. And like, that's one of the things I think I've heard you talk about before is like, you film a lot of your podcasts and, sorry, your podcasts, YouTube videos. And like, there's no editing. It's just like click and record. There's no fucking around. I don't got it. time to edit, bro. We don't even get, we're just, we just get it done. But, but that, that's what it's talking about. It's taking imperfect action, consistent and being relentless. And that's the same thing people need to apply to fitness is the reality is that most people it forces you to level up the results are in the like 99 percent of it's just fucking turning up like you said getting up early every morning it forces you to level up if you know you can't edit the motherfucker you're just like fuck i gotta fire this 10 minutes off perfectly you, you'll shock yourself at what you're capable of if you're selfless if you're like no i told the world i owe them my best and i don't give a fuck i'm setting the fucking camera up and I'm firing off everything from my heart right now. Fuck me. I don't give a fuck about how I look, how I sound, whatever. This worked for me, so it'll work for them. And you just try your fucking best. Like, my, like I said, when I came out on the stage at Nashville, I said, your first podcast is going to suck. Your first YouTube video is going to suck. Your first Instagram post is going to suck. But mine didn't. My first YouTube video got 700,000 views. My second got 3.4 million. But why? Why? I was creating all this stuff I talk about for 10 years on the prison yard. I was talking like this on the prison yard to bad motherfuckers. I'm definitely not going to set my camera up in the real cupcake land world this is and be all scared that Thomas from Illinois isn't going to like what I say. I don't give a fuck, Thomas. You're going to listen to what I fucking say. This is what people do wrong as influencers. They're asking for people's validation with this underlying fucking lack of confidence. They're asking people to val validate what they're saying. I'm telling you this will work, motherfucker. Because guess what? It worked, motherfucker. And it works, motherfucker. You know? And it's just like, once you build that body, build that confidence, the mind that comes with it, superficial people who've never built the body will never understand when it's mind, body, soul connection. They'll never get it. They just think that it's superficial to want to look good. And why do you think people don't get that? I think that comes from something from the early beginning. So I listened to you talk in another podcast earlier on today, you're talking about you were overweight when you were younger. Yeah. When I was younger, I was like, I, you know, your mom calls you uh, stocky or barrel. Yeah, chest. I was exactly the same. Yeah. She's like, yeah, you're stocky. It's like, mom, did you just call me fat? Like, fuck, what the fuck? Stocky, barrel chested. I got tits. What? It's like, like basically my, you know, they would make fun of me, but it wasn't all heckling and bad, but it sucks when you actually have little tits and a little gut and people are telling you, you got little tits and a little gut. And then you see the other kids and they got this perfectly smooth chest. They got these ripped abs. They're like tan. I'm like, fuck, why can't I be like that? That's your gift. Your pain is the prerequisite to your purpose. Like if you were overweight, you're supposed to heal that. And then teach your family, teach your kids, teach the world. If you grew up broke, you're supposed to heal that. And then teach your family, teach your kids, teach the world. Whatever you were gifted as pain, that is your gift to unlock the magic behind, to then solve and give to everybody. And I think that's this, it's a funny coincidence we're both the same in that aspect. Because I would say that's one of the biggest things people relate to me with is that I'm not genetically gifted. And obviously you're not going to be either if you were fat when you were younger as well. I think it's one of those things, it's almost like a skeleton in your closet that makes you very driven almost to go the other way because you've been there and you don't want to fucking go back. Like I'd never go back to that. Same as yeah. you're like never going to go back to being broke or anything like that. And that's what makes you like relentlessly driven. Yeah, see, I, I was in the gym this morning. I was like so pissed. Like, because there was a lot of the fat, like thinking they're strong, like big dudes. And, and I got so mad. 
Because I'm like, you're big, dog. If you just quit fucking eating like shit, you're going to look great. You're already big, homie. Like, what the fuck? You've been here for three fucking years. I said smack the shit out of you. You'd be happy. that. That's why I smack motherfuckers with the truth. Because they don't get how good they're going to look <clears throat> once they follow their macros. Once they really dial it in. Once they fucking drop that 40 pounds or 30 pounds of fat. They got them veins popping. They're a naturally big dude. I went on Brad Lee's podcast and uh, he started dieting and getting training like around the same time I got off his podcast. And then uh, 30 days later, he FaceTimed me and he said, um, bro, you wouldn't even notice how different I look in 30 days. Like, it's crazy. I look so different. And I said, no, I fully get that. That's why I'm so mad. And he's like, well, I'm like, that's why I'm so mad at, at everyone. Because I know how good they can be. And I believe in them. I know if they listen to me, I know everything they can be. I know how great their life will be, how much every, all the doors will open up for them. And they're still just sitting there, stuffing their face, downing alcohol, all this bullshit that keeps them from their best self. So I just get, it just really fucking just boils my blood when I see people throwing their life away, their potential, because I know everything they can be. Do you think that situation is getting worse and more people are getting pulled into that trap? Uh, it's just so split. There's so many people, but like, there's just such a big fitness community. But then like, if we're talking masses, yeah, everyone's believing that like, it's okay to just be you. No, it's not motherfucker. You're supposed to grow and change and work. You're not okay how you are. Like that's fucked up to send your kid to school fat and say he's your little fucking buttercup. It's okay, Michael. Go to school fucking all plump and supple and get made fun of for being a pasty fat little fuck at 16. Like, you know how mean you are sending your kid to school all fat when your dumb ass as a parent could have learned macros and fed him like, even if he wanted pizza, you could have made it right. Even if his fat ass wanted tacos, you could have made them with lean uh, 96 foreground beef, some fucking reduced fat uh, cheese and like kept the fucking fat down. You don't have to fucking be so belligerent to the facts of why you're making your kids fat. I think fat people just, I think underachievers, lazy fucks and fat people just, they want to feel comfortable. That's why they're fat. So they want you to suck too. They don't want you to be good at anything. They don't want you to level up and they don't realize subconsciously they're doing that to their kids. I think that's one of the things you said about, um, there reminds me of I think something I see a lot of people end up dragging people down around them. So almost you see it. Like, if, if a guy starts getting in great shape, his missus will then start getting uh, insecure because she's worried he's going to run off with a younger shit. woman. And then she'll start. I would congratulate. Yeah. When, when, some, when one of my clients won't like wives or something, it's like on board, like, nah, you need to sign up for the year, not the six months. I'm like, dude, she's awesome. She's awesome. But that's but what yeah, you want. You really, want to support partners push you. Yeah. Th see, this is the thing. Those people have yet to just understand that discomfort is growth. So if they're going to get better in life, they're going to have to be uncomfortable. And by you raising yourself, raising your frequency, dropping weight, feeling better about yourself, getting in shape, then your frequency is high and it's actually calling them up. And a lazy person, a fucking stagnant person, a comfortable person, that feels like discomfort to them. And they're so dumb they think it's you doing it to them, but really it's their conscience calling them to be more, but they blame you because they're so out of touch with their inner voice. Like I've been around people who are drinking and they're like, I can't even enjoy my drink around you. I said, good motherfucker. And that, that ain't me. That's your inner voice, stupid. I'm not in your head. I don't even care if you drink right now. I wasn't even worried about it. You're worried about it though. That's your inner voice. And they say your conscience is the authentic voice of God. I, I believe in conscious congruency. So conscience congruency. If you live in congruence with your conscience, you will live the best life you could possibly live. So you have to just slow down, listen to your inner voice, step in the mirror and listen to what it tells you to do. If today it tells you, you got to drop 15 pounds, get that done. And then next it tells you, you got to quit being such a dick, get it done. First thing it's probably going to tell you is, you got to quit drinking, doing the drugs or any of those. Because usually the vices have to go before you can even commit to a workout program or anything. 
one of the big things I see is a lot of people struggle with their own self-belief that they can actually see something through and transform their physique, their body or, or their business. What do you, what do you, what would you say to that person? Well, that's what we are. So we are their, like we're their visual representation of what's possible. And then we become their self-talk. So if you're, they, they need a vision and they need their internal dialogue correct. So by making motivational videos that keep their internal dialogue strong, then you can keep your clients on track. So you shouldn't be messing your clients a shitload. You should be making such motivational content that their internal dialogue is congruent with the path they're walking. Now you just have to really keep showing them transformations, keep showing them what they could be, keep showing them how, how in shape you are and that you show up every day. Now they have the blueprint. They have the internal dialogue that matches the vision. And like I said, vision and action will get the job done. But all too often, people's self-talk is off. So like, I got this buddy. He's like one of the most famous fucking internet people in the fucking world. He's like right here. And um, he said on a post one time that being a, a, a fat leader was hypocritical. And then he started trying to get a six pack. And that year, he almost got a six pack. Now this year, he's back up at 300 fucking pounds. And the thing is, is like, I just could never fathom how when he goes and works out, he says how miserable it is. Why are we so stupid? Why do we suffer from cognitive dissonance so much? Why would you tell yourself, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. We've made hunger negative. You have to say something positive. If you are hungry and you're cutting fat, you're exactly where you want to be. You tell yourself, this is what fat loss feels like. I'm cutting up. This is what fat loss feels like. I'm cutting up. I'm exactly where I want to be. You can't tell yourself a negative and get a positive. So, I mean, they're working out doing legs or something. They're, this is miserable. I'm doing legs like motherfucker. I'm getting 25 with 315 right now. I don't give a fuck if I die. Like, this is my, this is. I'm proving to my son who I am right now, motherfucker, what? You know, and these people are, their internal dialogue is so soft that it actually shapes their exterior. It's called like the terrain feature. Like you, you become how you're, the way you speak and live, your body shapes after that. It's like a fucking, it's, you start to formulate a soft interior, a soft exterior is the fucking, it proves that you have a soft interior. 100%. Where's the, what would say is the big, biggest thing that's driven your mindset? A lot of reading in prison, a lot of time to reflect? Dude, just fucking, um, okay, so this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing that nobody gets. During times of adversity, a conscious individual gets more conscious. During times of adversity, an unconscious individual gets less conscious. So when you look forward to adversity, your awareness goes up. And so during, you know, when you had that breakup, you thought about everything so much. You never thought so much in your life. You know how when you're fucking whooping ass in a workout or you're driven or there's a problem, you're thinking, I face problems. And I face problems, massive problems, problems that would break people. I face them with a fucking unbreakable, non-negotiable mindset. So doing 10 years in prison, there were times I was in segregation for over a year at a time. Now the door would close and I know it's not opening for a year. Everybody else would be like, fuck, like, no, we don't have enough coffee. We don't have enough soups, like top ramen noodles. We don't have enough beans. We don't got enough food. We don't got enough of anything. And they just start freaking out. I would just be stoic about it. I would just be like, good motherfucker. And I just go into a workout that fucking was something that made me so proud. I didn't need shit. And that's what I've learned to validate myself. with: The fact that when everything else was taken from me, I still had me. And would you say, you said obviously the workouts, there's a big thing that drives you and that's why you have at the start of your day. Do you think that sets the tone for the day and the rhythm almost? Always. You can't think your way into positive action. You have to act your way into positive thinking. And people don't get that. Dude, when you literally, when you work out, you raise your frequency so high that your frequency is what you frequently see. And if you're at a high frequency, you see the world correctly. 
everybody is walking around at a low frequency state because they're just, it's like the lowest frequency emotion is guilt and shame. And everybody has such shameful and they, they have such bad habits that they operate from guilt and shame more often than not. You'd rather be angry. Anger is like the highest of low frequency emotional states. Guilt and shame is at the bottom. The top is enlightenment and gratitude. But this is what you do. If you end up doing something you regret or you're shameful of, you realize you're at the bottom, the lowest frequency. You're feeling like shit. You dug yourself in a hole. You have to accept what you've done. And acceptance, neutrality, is, a, is four steps up the chart from pride on high frequency emotions. It's really a high frequency emotion to just accept and stay neutral. So you go from guilt and shame at the bottom and you just accept the fucking situation as it is. Once you've accepted it, you're already vibrating high. You're already feeling better. Now you go into another high frequency emotional state, which is love and love for self is self-investment. So you accept what you've done. You go into a workout that is self-investment, self-love. Now, after that workout, you go from love, which is a high frequency emotional state to pure enlightenment. And you realize that you drove to the gym, not really feeling that song. And when you left the gym, you just saw, whoa, this shit's a shit. Like nobody leaves the gym pissed off. It's the only place where everybody holds the door for everybody. They don't do that at the grocery store, the bank, the fucking, the mall, nowhere. They do it at the gym though. That's the one big thing there. Like even you saying that made me smile. And it's one of those things you said earlier is in regards to self-love. And a lot of people think it's bad to be set for self-love and also to be selfless. But one of the things, uh, selfish, sorry, one of the things I love to say is that you have to be selfish to be selfless because if you don't put yourself first to become the greatest version of you, how can you support all those around you? Exactly. You're, 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 bringing, you're bringing a lesser figure to them. Like I said, the offering. Like... Nobody gives a fuck if nobody, if some nobody comes up and tells someone, hey, you're really killing it today. Like if you get a DM from Grant Sisteroni from New Jersey with 10 followers and he's like, hey, you're really killing it, Charlie. You're like, ah, what the fuck? Who the fuck's this guy? And if you get a, if you get a DM from Grant Cardone and he's like, hey, Charlie, I like what you're doing. I want to work with you in business. You're like, oh, shit. It feels better because this person has done more in life do more in life, be honest that results matter, winning matters, and don't believe that people should just accept you how you are. Everybody judges everyone. This is the reality. Wake the fuck up and make sure you're being judged correctly because I want my people to love me and love ain't lies. If your kids have to be like, no, dad, you're not that fat. It's all good. If your wife has to say, hey, honey, like, no, you look good. And really, you know, you look like shit. You're fucking pasty pale. You got tits, a gut, there's hair everywhere. You know she's looking at me in Charlie's page. You just know <laughs> it's just what's going on. Like, it just let's just be factual. You don't want to have all the money in the world and have her looking at me in Charlie's fucking page. Like, you've just, you fucked up. Like, you got all the money validated with the money, fucking got married for the money, and then you just trashed your body, and now there's just nothing. You have to, you have, to have everything... Ripped rich rare. You have to have be everything across the board to know that for sure motherfuckers can't lie to you. There's no way they can't be impressed by you because we respect results because we respect what we don't have. If someone did better than you, we have to respect it unless we're haters and we know haters hate on what they gave up on. That's just what they're doing. So, I mean, everyone needs to get back to knowing that results fucking matter. Winning fucking matters. We are all in competition. The, the job you want, you're in competition with someone else. The woman you want, you're in competition with other men. You're in competition with everybody on social media. Everyone's in fucking competition. Obviously, it starts as I'm just in competition with me to better me, but you get so I don't look at anyone else's shit. So I am in competition with me, but I know where everyone else stands and I have to be better and be undeniable if I want a top spot. I don't want to be number one as the best motivational speaker talking about discipline, but be a fat fuck like half these motivational speakers. How the fuck is your fat ass going to get on the channel and be like, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. What? You couldn't quit eating tacos, homeboy? Like, 
you telling me you could do anything if you put your mind to it, but you're fat. You can do anything. Like, what the fuck is that? And people do that to their families and their kids too. You can do anything, son. Like, just go ahead and get it. Shut the fuck up, dad. I wish a kid told him that. When a dad says, nah, son, you could be anything you want to be. I wish the kid said, dad, shut the fuck up. Why aren't you then? Why don't you start doing that, dad? See what I'm saying? Love ain't lies. Wes Watson loves you. He ain't going to lie to you. And when you, and guess what? When you kill it in life, Wes Watson's going to be the first one to be like, damn, that Rolls Royce is sick. Fuck yeah, your abs look dope. I fucking love it. As long as you're not a shit bag. And what people don't get, they really don't get this big thing. They say the loudest person in the room is the weakest. Be more humble. Humble is intentions. And your insecurities will never alter my intentions, motherfucker. And I want Charlie to be the best. I want my wife to be the best. I want that guy on the street down there that I yelled at why he's fucking drinking at nine in the morning to be his best. That's why I gave him my fucking energy. What does winning look like to you? Winning looks like doing everything you can with what you got to be where you want to be. It, winning to me is that vision you have of your life at the highest ability, creating that and then gifting it to the world. So I say our life's purpose and winning is if you're living your life's purpose, your life's purpose and mine is to create the man you admire in every way and give him to the world. So that's self-actualization and self-transcendence. Maslow's law proves this too, that growth needs are self-actualization. The height of the growth needs pyramid is self-transcendence. And that's what I came up with that quote in prison that was like, that's what I believe our life's purpose is, to create the man we admire and then give him to the world. Because in all reality, the biggest flex is how you affect those around you. That's the biggest thing. Because I don't care. Like, I drove a different Rolls Royce to the gym yesterday as I did today. I didn't feel any different. It doesn't feel any different. It's cool sometimes. You're like, oh, I did some shit. Like, oh, cool. I, I did some shit. I, I wrote uh, an international best-selling book. And I had to get up at 2 a.m. to write this. Because... 245 wasn't cutting. My schedule was too fucking stacked. So I got up early and that was making sure my work ethic was there. But that's the thing is none of that shit even matters because I had to bring my best to you today. And then I have to bring my best to my wife today. The best thing about being institutionalized and being in isolation as long as I have been, I only live one day at a time. I don't even give a fuck about the future. I don't give a fuck. Like I already won, bro. I already won. Like, I won. And if I, I live today perfectly, that must be the most pure thing that I don't think anyone else could get without that experience. No one, nobody can imagine that if for 10 years you were forced to just monotask and live in the moment, because the future was way too painful. You're not getting out for 10 years. Why would you move ahead? And then the past, fuck, that was depressing as fuck. I lost everything. Everything's gone. I'll never see any of these people again. They're all gone. Everything's gone. Like nobody came to see me for 10 years. Literally. I, I would talk to some people every now and then, but I didn't see one person for 10 fucking years. You guys couldn't go 10 hours, 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months. Like this shit would break you. And that's fine. I've been broken so many times that nothing could break me anymore. And that's the beautiful thing. I faced the pain with more pain. Every time I was in pain, instead of sitting there in it like a bitch, I just started whooping, whooping workouts, like a thousand bodyweight squats in the cell, sets of like 150 with like a minute rest in between. Just, dude, I built like world-class quads with body weight just through pain, bro, just killing myself. And it's just, it was so beautiful because every day I was in so much pain from missing the world. And every day through that workout, I would bust open a book with some quotes or some positive affirmations in it, put it there. And then I would do my set, read a, read a fucking sentence, do my set, read a sentence. I came into that workout in tears, fucking so broken. I left tears of gratitude, so fulfilled every time. What does the future hold for Wes Watson? 
I just one day at a time, not breaking character. My main goal right now is to just be better as a husband and father. And because I am real intense, I am quick to, to fucking be reactive. And I'm, I'm, working, I'm working on myself. I mean, I've only been a dad for three fucking years, like four years. And I've only, I've only, been, I've only been a dad for three years. I've only been married for three years. And I fucking, I'm new to it. Like, and I preach all this shit that I know all this shit. And I'm like, no, that's self-mastery, motherfucker. I'm new to relationships and being a father, I have to still learn this. Like people stand on their strengths and they think they're applicable to other areas. You gotta be humble and be a beginner again. And I am in this area. So that's my main focus is to be better here. And I see how bad I suck. Like, like I'm like real, I'm real good at me, but like being in isolation, living in prison for so long, it just, it makes me monotask so hard. I really get stuck in, I'm stuck in this call so much. I don't even know what the fuck, where we are, what day, what time, anything. So, I mean, it's a gift and a curse. It's a vice and a virtue. So I'm, I'm bridging uh, my gifts to my weaknesses. I'm, I'm magnifying my weaknesses to level up. And my weakness is that I'm not that good in the, in the real world yet. And I don't expect to be. I'm really good at what I do in business and what I do with everything that's under my control, I'm really good at. And helping people control themselves, I'm fucking the best at. But, you know, working with others and in, in everything like in, you know, family and life and all that stuff, I don't really, it's hard to be as compassionate as you need to be when you've seen people's feet cut off right in front of you and murders and all this shit in prison and just people being ruthlessly beaten and stabbed and murdered. When people are like mad about something small out here or they're upset about something that's so minor, you ate the last taco or something, you're like, how could you be mad about that? They're like, it's not the point. So it's not the taco, it's the point. I'm like, dude, it's a, God, it's a taco. I'll go get you another one. Like people out here get so twisted about shit that I could never see as a problem. And so like, the main shit is, is me being more compassionate towards like people's level of growth to what they call a problem so that I can guide them better. 100%. For people to find out more about you, Wes, where's the best place? Instagram, YouTube, what are your channel's names? WesWatson.com, uh, Watson underscore fit on Instagram, and um, GP Penitentiary Life with Wes Watson on uh, YouTube. So GP Penitentiary Life, Wes Watson on YouTube and then uh, and you get my book on Amazon non-negotiable 10 years incarcerated creating the unbreakable mindset by Wes Watson I took this picture in prison with the cell phone and the cops told me take that shit off your Instagram I'm like no nah, I'm gonna make millions off these pics and they're like what the fuck are you talking about when I first saw Instagram I knew like I saw Rich Piana blasting arms and motivational shit and I saw these buff ass dudes with uh real motivational captions. I'm like, oh, this is powerful. And then I was like, I see how this works. I'm going to use this and I'm going to do this. I never really thought about like money was never the driver because I was always fixated on feeling better. But I saw how easy it was to just outdo everybody because they ain't consistent. And that's the name of the game when it comes to fat loss or business or anything. Name of the game is consistency. I mean, content is king in business online. And then with your diet and everything, it's, it's consistency. It's, it, it, it's consistency plus it, consistency, comprehension, and intensity. So it, like, because I always say, without comprehension, consistency isn't shit. Because there's plenty of, the most common thing on the planet is a consistent man who is not successful because he doesn't have a proper blueprint. So all you consistent men out there in the gym, or at your job or whatever, come get a blueprint from someone successful. It doesn't even have to be me. It could be anybody who has a better blueprint for you because you're showing up every day, but you're not where you want to be. The guy who shows up to the gym every day, every day he's there and he looks like shit still. It's because he doesn't comprehend the blueprint that he needs to couple up with his consistency. 100%. We'll wrap that up there. 
Um, so for everyone who absolutely loved this and there's a ton of value and ton of motivation from Wes, make sure you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, share your stories, tag me, Wes, I'll share it. And we'll see you in the next episode very, very soon.